Everybody wants predator food. If you were to say, if you were to say, hey, uh, I'll give you a whole lot of ladybug food in your garden, people would be like, okay. <laughs> Here's a bucket full of aphids. <laughs> Welcome back to the garden. Today, we're gonna to be going through here and trying to identify and locate as many of the uh, bugs that most people call pests as we can. Now, there are definitely a number of them in here. And I would say, without question, the number one pest in my garden are roly polies. But there's a few other like aphids and things like that that we're gonna find, uh, maybe some worms here or there, uh, green caterpillars, things like that. So let's get in here, try to find some of these things, and we'll talk about each one and what to do about them if anything. So this plant right here is actually not one that I planted. I believe it's some type of seed that, that sprouted up from a bird feeder. So it might be a sunflower or something like that. But if you look at it, it is covered with fire ants. And usually when you see fire ants on your plant like that, it indicates aphids because the fire ants will farm the aphids, so to speak, and eat the secretion that comes out their back end which is just a fancy way of saying that they eat the aphid poop. <laughs> uh, but anyway, as soon as people see this, they like to throw diatomaceous earth on it or you know, spray it with some type of soapy water mixture, kill the aphids. Well, if you take a look down in here, there's a ladybug. And ladybugs love to eat aphids. They are very efficient aphid killers. And also right here, there is a ladybug in like the second or third stage. I'm not sure what stage that is, but it hadn't hatched out yet. So there's definitely ladybugs in the area naturally here. Now, a lot of people might be inclined to remove this plant. If they have a plant that's just infested with aphids, it's really easy just you know, to pull it up out of the ground and go throw it in the garbage can. But if you remove the plant, or if you were to just throw diatomaceous earth or kill all these aphids, what do you think would happen to the ladybugs? Well, they're not going to hang around because there's no food for them. So, yes, you can maintain your garden that way and killing all the aphids and pest bugs by just killing them or removing them, but you're never going to have an established predator bug presence in your garden if you keep taking all their food away. So even though this is not a plant that I put here, um, it's attracting aphids and ladybugs and it's not harming any of my fruits or vegetables. So I'm just happy that it's here and I'm just going to let it do its thing. So here we have some collard greens, and uh, one of these was really eaten up with some little worms. As you can see, this plant has seen better days. And we've been harvesting these uh, pretty consistently ever since, um, well shoot, early, early, early spring or late winter. They've been doing really well. But as you can see, they're going to seed, so they're coming up on the end of their life cycle. So not too concerned with pests on these guys. But the little worm, you can see one right here. I think this, is, this guy's dead. That little guy right there, that was the main culprit on these collard greens. But they really didn't even show up until like a week ago and pretty much the season is over for these. So not really an issue at all. So um, I can't find any of the green ones on the bottom side of the leaves. Um, so not really any need to treat it. I'm gonna let these collard greens go to seed. As you can see, the bees are enjoying it. And then uh, once, the, once the seeds are done, I'll pull them up. Not really an issue. So I'm just walking through here and I just want to show you what what kind of leaving nature to nature will do for you. There's a uh, another ladybug there in the making. Here's another one here on my tomato. And so they're they're really all over here. I, I've ever since last year I've had a really heavy ladybug presence, which definitely is going to play a factor in keeping the aphid population down. But it takes time. Sometimes sometimes you got to sacrifice a season or two in order to, uh, to let the predators uh, establish themselves. Now the roly-polies are starting to get a little frustrating. I've planted this strip right here of, of uh, green beans at least three times. <laughs> they, the green beans come up nicely and then the, the roly-polies just wipe them out as soon as they get a couple of leaves on them. I've done the same thing in a few spots over there, playing it multiple times, and the, and the, uh, the, the roly-polies love the tender green bean leaves. Another place that the 
roly pullies are hitting hard on my strawberries. I'd say 80% of my strawberries look like this, which is a huge bummer because <laughs> strawberries are one of my favorite crops I grow. So the roly pullies are really making it difficult on a lot of my plants. The young stuff especially, the strawberries, heck, they're, they're so prevalent they're even eating healthy plants on occasion. So they're kind of a pain right now. But there is a beneficial side to roly pullies, like most bugs. They always have a good and a bad. And the good thing about roly pullies is that they are known to clean toxins out of soils. I think specifically it's heavy metals that they remove. Uh, the way that works is they go along eating the decaying and composting matter and uh, whenever they ingest the toxin they I think form like a crystal around it or crystallize it and then it comes out inert and so that's a great great thing because one of the most uh, common reasons to start a garden like this is to eat cleaner food it's free of all the chemicals and and harsh things that are that's put on the food in in, uh, in stores so if there's a soil problem these guys are actually here helping and I would feel kind of bad if I removed them all only to find out that there was poison in my soil. So the question is, should they stay or should they go? Now sure, there are a lot of, you know, really localized or I would say micromanagerial uh, techniques to try to reduce your roly poly population. I've seen people, you know, take orange slices or some type of fruit, put it all around the plant, and that attracts the roly polies, and then you pick that up and then shake it in the trash or wherever and put the stuff back. But when you're dealing with a large scale operation, that's just not a, a realistic um, process. There's just way too many roly polies and way too much area to cover to use something like that. So really the only thing that I would consider using at this point is a product called Sluggo Plus, which I've seen everybody recommend uh, on all the gardening pages that I follow. And apparently it's very effective. And so that I've, I've definitely been given that product a lot of thought. Now, whether I will actually use it, I don't know. I might, I might just grit my teeth, get through this year, and see what happens next year. You know, maybe all of this is happening for a reason, and uh, next year that reason will be removed and the early poly population will go down. Um, so we'll see. I'm going to put a lot of thought into it. So that's really the only pest that I've been dealing with at this point. Now, it's still very early in the year, and I can tell that there's going to be a lot of things uh, start emerging, like June bugs. Uh, whenever I dig a hole in the ground, there are grubs everywhere. And so they're not a problem just yet. But if I remember correctly, last year, it was about this time when I started seeing them emerge, and they kind of did the same thing. They would attack every plant that was young, um, you know, squash, watermelons, things like that. So been very fortunate uh, up to this point, and maybe we'll do another video like this, you know, midsummer, say at the end of May or a little bit later, as these insects have had time to come out. Uh, and get hungry <laughs> but we're not there yet the squash bugs haven't shown up yet obviously um, you know last year I had a few things like leaf miners in my tomato plants and peppers not a big deal uh, the goal here is not really to eliminate all those pests or so-called pests you could also view them as you know predator food is another way to to look at them and everybody wants predator food if you were to say <laughs> if you were to say hey uh, I'll give you a whole lot of ladybug food in your garden people would be like, okay, <laughs> here's a bucket full of aphids. <laughs> um, so I'm not trying to eliminate any of these things. I want to strike a balance and that balance just takes time. And so one year you might have a really heavy infestation of something. Leave it alone. Predators move in. Next year it's under control and the predators hang around because they have food. So it's all about a balance. Uh, if some of them are eradicated, you know, I'd be fine with that too. Uh, but I'm not intentionally going after anything except fire ants <laughs> uh, for 100% removal. Fire ants are another story. I'm absolutely trying to remove 100% of the fire ants. <laughs> so it's all about balance. And it's all about time. You know, get rich quick sounds really good, but it's it doesn't happen very often. You know, a beautiful garden doesn't happen overnight. So don't look to fix everything in one season. You know, let it develop. It takes time. So if you don't have just the, the enough nature, <laughs> enough space, enough plants uh, for, this, for these type of small ecosystems to uh, develop, then you are going to have to use you know, more chemicals, sprays, pesticides, things like that. Because that's further away from nature and further away from the original design of all of this stuff. 
And the further away you get from the original design in nature, the more upkeep uh, and more unnatural methods you're gonna have to use. Now, I'm not saying don't do that. Yeah, if that's all you can do, go ahead, go for it. You know, if, if, if all you have is a balcony and you can do container gardening on your balcony, sure, use sluggo, you know, use uh, all of these organic methods to control pests. You have to. Um, that's better than not growing at all. But for me, I have enough space in my yard that I have developed a small ecosystem um, and I believe it's getting better every year. So if you've got the space, uh, I love this method. But if you don't have the space, don't feel like I'm, you know, dogging you for, for using diatomaceous earth like on occasion. That's not what I'm doing. Yeah.